what happened when Pauline Cafferkey returned to the UK. The nurse who survived Ebola is facing a disciplinary hearing over accusations she knew she had a high temperature at Heathrow. Also this lunchtime, why George Osborne and Jeremy Corbyn are set to lose their seats and Labour's not happy. It's going to be a fantastic gold medal. Ellie Simmons takes gold in a world... Three goals in 40 minutes. How Britain's swimmers shone in Rio. And a September scorcher. How parts of Britain are hitting record highs. This is ITV News with Nina Hussain. Good afternoon. Pauline Cafferkey was the first person to be diagnosed with Ebola in Britain. The nurse contracted the deadly disease while working in Sierra Leone two years ago. She's fought off it three times, but today faces a new fight, this time over her professional conduct. She's been accused of allowing a false temperature to be recorded during health checks on her return to Heathrow. If she is found guilty, she could be struck off. Paul Davis has the story. She is the nurse who volunteered to help victims of one of the world's deadliest diseases, only to contract it herself. Still recovering from the long-term health implications, Pauline Cafferkey arrived today at the professional tribunal where she faces allegations of misconduct. The hearing will focus on what happened when Pauline Cafferkey returned to Heathrow Airport from Sierra Leone in 2014. The charge is that the nurse allowed an incorrect temperature to be taken, concealing the fact that she had a fever. Pauline Cafferkey is accused of giving dishonest answers to medical staff after arriving at Heathrow. She was diagnosed with Ebola the next day and put into isolation at London's Royal Free Hospital before being declared free of infection a month later. She's been readmitted twice since then. In February last year, the Nursing and Midwifery Council said the nurse was being investigated over alleged misconduct. The 40-year-old nurse seen here being transferred to the Royal Free Hospital has said she hopes the case against her will be dismissed. Earlier this summer, she told ITV's Julie Etchingham what it's like to contract Ebola. When it was tough the first time, but second time round, it was just... It was horrendous. There was so much wrong with my body, I wouldn't know where to start. Like, one side of my face was, was drooped. I had hearing loss and just having the, the worst headache of my life. At the outset of today's hearing, the Nursing and Midwifery Council took the unusual step of saying it may now withdraw the accusation that Pauline Cafferkey acted dishonestly. Paul Davis, ITV News. Our Scotland correspondent, Peter Smith, has been at the disciplinary hearing. He joins me now from Edinburgh. Peter, what happens next? Well, what happens next is that Pauline Cafferkey and her legal team will return to the hearing at 3 o'clock this afternoon and they will be presented with three charges. Now, just an update on the back of um, Paul's report there. Now, the, the nursing, nursing Midwifery Council has accepted that there was no dishonesty. She doesn't have a case to answer. They're saying that her decision-making would have been impaired because of the early uh, effects of Ebola and fatigue after a long journey. But the three charges she will be presented with at 3 o'clock, I have them in my hand now. One is that she allowed an incorrect temperature to be recorded on the screening form at Heathrow Airport. She didn't tell anyone that that had happened. And later, when she was being checked, she failed to disclose that she'd taken paracetamol. Now, this hearing is expected to go into tomorrow, and the Nursing Midwifery Council has the power to strike her off. But Pauline Cafferkey, of course, disputes these allegations. Peter Smith, thank you. Some of the biggest names in British politics, including Jeremy Corbyn and George Osborne, could find their futures under threat because of major new plans to change their constituencies. The Boundaries Commission has been asked to draw up proposals which reduce the number of MPs from 650 to 600. But Labour says the move isn't fair to them. Here's our political correspondent, Paul Brand. They've spent a lifetime trying to win elections, but boundary changes may leave these politicians with nowhere left to fight. As constituencies shift and merge, many MPs may disappear with their seats, including the Labour leader who's not happy he could be swallowed up by neighbouring comrades in London. Let's get together 
to challenge the system the Boundary Commission is using as a party to make sure that there is good democracy in this country with fair and equal representation between all parts of the country. In total, the number of MPs is set to fall from 650 to 600, with today's proposals cutting England's from 533 to 501 and the number in Wales from 40 to 29. Details on how Scotland will go from 59 to 53 MPs will be published next month, while Northern Ireland's reduction from 18 to 17 has already been announced. The government says all that change will equalise the size of constituencies whilst also saving money. As a government, we want to cut the cost of politics. It's right that having made savings elsewhere, MPs should be able to put their own house in order. This measure is going to save £66 million over the course of a parliament. That's quite a lot of money. And so we need to cut the cost of politics, and we need to do so by cutting the number of MPs. But there will be a huge cost for Labour, especially in places like Wales. The difficulty is that there's a huge mountain dividing uh, that ward and, and that ward. And Wayne David's seat in Carfilly is being merged with his neighbour. The Conservatives say they, they're trying to save money, but at the same time they're making hundreds of extra members of House of Lords. So there's no real saving. It's all about having party political advantage for the Conservative Party. Labour also says the new boundaries are drawn around old data, which leaves two million people off the electoral register. And here in Pontypridd, the leadership challenger, Owen Smith, will face another challenge just to keep his seat as it's split in half. It doesn't make much sense really, does it? Why do you say that? Because Pontypridd is one town, eh? it's, so it's not two towns. It makes no difference to us, well, whatsoever. I know you've got quite a lot of MPs, but really speaking, they're not doing a lot of good to us. Good or bad, there'll be far fewer MPs doing anything if these plans go through. The most immediate effect of these changes for MPs is that their focus will now switch from fighting the opposite party to keep hold of their seat to fighting within their own party to make sure they have somewhere to stand. And when you look at the Labour Party, which is split over the issue of Jeremy Corbyn, well, this adds a whole lot more ammunition to that particular civil war with some pretty nasty selection battles, I think coming down the line. Mm. Paul Brand, many thanks. It took Great Britain swimmers just 40 minutes to score a hat-trick of goals in the pool in Rio overnight. Two of the winning swimmers, Ellie Simmons and Sasha Kindred, also set world records. In all, Paralympics GB added five goals to its medal tally on day five. Nick Wallace has the best of the overnight action. 13 world titles, 10 European titles, multiple world record holder, double Paralympic champion in both Beijing and London, Eleanor May Simmons, OBE, has achieved a lot in her 21 years. But on day five of the Rio Paralympics, she proved she was hungry for more. Simmons started slowly, although she pushed hard by the first turn she was in sixth place. But superior fitness and endless reserves of determination gave her the edge. Ellie Simmons, Ellie Simmons, on her way to gold! She eventually powered home to retain her 200-metre individual medley gold and broke her own world record in the process. And she is the first SM6 swimmer under the three-minute mark. Job done. Sasha Kindred! Shortly before Ellie's victory, 38-year-old Sasha Kindred, competing in his sixth Paralympic Games, rolled back the years to bring home gold and another world record in the men's 200-metre individual medley. And reaction of the night goes to Susie Rogers, who completed a golden hour for British swimming by clinching top spot in the 50-metre butterfly final. Susie Rogers has done it! To the delight of her mum in the stands. Even after she got out of the pool, Rogers still couldn't quite believe her achievement. <laughs> oh, fantastic! Oh, Susie bless Rogers her little cannot heart. believe it! Both Susie Rogers and Ellie Simmons swim again in Rio, so for them, celebrations can't get too out of hand. But after receiving her gold medal, nothing was going to stop one of Britain's biggest Paralympic stars from shedding a few tears of joy with her parents, Val and Steve. Nick Wallace, ITV News. Well, we can go live now to Rio and join Richard Palo. Ellie Simmons back in action today, as is David Weir, after his disappointment yesterday. Yeah, there's no rest for Ellie Simmons. She's back in action, trying to defend the title, the 400 metres free that she won in London. Also in action is Ollie Hind. He's looking for a second gold as well. He's in the 100 metres backstroke and across town at the Athletic Stadium. It's all about Georgina Hermitage. Now, she won the 100 metres earlier in the week. She's now competing in the 400 metres. And actually, she watched London 2012 from her couch while pro pregnant 
with her daughter Tilly. She said she was so inspired by the likes of David Weir that she wanted to get involved and to get here. David Weir himself is in action, back in action, but at the age of 37, there is a school of thought that perhaps his best days may be behind him. It's very hot in Rio this week. He didn't do well in his first race 400. He's back in action in the 15 hundred meters but he says that the class and the standards have improved hugely in just the last four years and if you want proof of that an example of that have a look at the t13 men's 1500 meters race last night the first four finishers home all finished in a quicker time than the man that won the olympic title in the same category last month goodness richard Palo in rio thank you here, the inflation rate has remained unchanged in the year to August as rising food prices have been offset by a fall in the cost of clothing and wine. Inflation rose by 0.6% last month, lower than the expected rise to 0.7% predicted by economists. Our business editor, Joel Hills, is here. Why didn't this expected rise happen then, do you think? Uh, well, the headline figure hasn't changed, but companies are saying already that they are seeing price rises. Manufacturers uh, are clear that the prices they're paying for the raw materials they bash around and reshape mm. uh, has shot up very clearly. What has not happened yet, though, uh, is that those price rises are not being seen online and they're not being seen on the high street. Consumers aren't feeling them. Mm. But that's not to say that they won't. The Bank of England's forecast is that inflation will hit 2%, their target, and go above it uh, in the early part of uh, next year. And there's no reason to believe that that won't yet come to pass. Uh, we've heard house price inflation uh, still roaring away. Uh, house prices look head for the stratosphere. The price of the average house last month, £217,000. £1,000 higher than it was in June just before the referendum. Um, the Treasury short-term forecasts about an immediate recession, job losses, runaway inflation, a squeeze on living standards currently look ridiculous. But... <laughs> reality check. Negotiations are oncoming. Our fortunes are tied to the outcome of the talks and the settlement Britain has. If we leave the uh, free trade area, the single market, uh, it's very possible there will be economic damage that we experience. Joel Hills, many thanks. Still to come. Oompa, loompa, doompa, da, dee. He created a world of pure imagination 100 years since his birth, all Dahl's fam family and friends on his life and legacy. He always said, great writers, artists, creative people aren't really recognised until they die. And summer's not over yet, as forecasters confirm today is the hottest September day in almost 70 years. First, there are calls for urgent action to be taken to end the widespread sexual harassment of girls. A committee of MPs found that nearly a third of girls aged between 16 and 18 said they'd been touched or harassed at school or college. The report also found that primary school pupils are being increasingly exposed to pornography. Charlotte Grant has the details. When they walk inside, it should be a place where schoolgirls feel safe. But sexual harassment, it seems, is all too common, with girls experiencing groping and name-calling that, according to MPs, is becoming part of everyday life. Holly, as she wants to be called, is 16. She says it wasn't long after starting secondary school that the harassment began. I've been called slut, slag, I've had my skirt pulled up in front of massive groups of people. People trying to grope you in the corridors or pull you, it's just really unpleasant. It's really degrading, it makes you feel so unsafe in an environment that's meant to protect you really. A group of MPs is warning that sexual harassment is being dismissed by teachers, so they're recommending compulsory sex education classes with the watchdog Ofsted monitoring how well schools tackle sexual harassment. And if I were to experience what some of the young people who've given evidence to our committee, if I were to experience that problem in the House of Commons today, I'd report it to the authorities, but young people haven't got that full back and we need to take that seriously. Victoria is now 20. She says when she was at school, being subjected to derogatory comments was part of classroom life. I was quite embarrassed and 
I, uh, I know that other people around me were embarrassed by the comments that they were receiving and I know they didn't like it but they just sort of had to accept the fact that that's what happened to them as girls. For pupils and for teachers, MPs want to make sure sexual harassment is viewed as not just unwanted but unacceptable. Charlotte Grant, ITV News. The Prime Minister is facing increasing pressure to order an inquiry into police behaviour at the so-called Battle of Orgreave Miners strike in the 1980s. Campaigners are due to meet the Home Secretary Amber Rudd later this afternoon where they will once again push for an official investigation into clashes between police and protesters outside the plant in 1984. And Channel 4 has admitted that the judges of, and presenters of the Great British Bake Off haven't yet signed deals to move to the broadcaster when the show leaves the BBC after the current series. Channel 4 has said it would be delighted if they do. Schools around the country are celebrating the birth of Roald Dahl a hundred years ago today. Creator of too many children's favourites, to mention them all, his characters such as Willy Wonka, Matilda and the BFG have endured the decades. His books are still much loved and the stories translate with ease to stage and screen. In one he wrote, those who don't believe in magic will never find it. His fans certainly found his storytelling magical. In a moment we'll discuss why. First, here's Sally Biddle on Roald Dahl Day. I catch dreams. The BFG may have caught them, but Roald Dahl wrote them. A wonder crump of an author creating books which have fueled children's imaginations. And today, on what would have been his 100th birthday, they celebrated his stories. I like Roald Dahl so much because, well, he's probably the best children's author ever and I've read all of his books. I'm Ellie and I'm dressed up as Sophie from the BFG. There is no life I know to compare with pure imagination. The likes of Willy Wonka have become household names and invented words like Oompa Loompa have made it into the Oxford English Dictionary. And it was all created in a hut in his garden, a modest writer's hideaway where remarkable tales found their way onto the page. Once you're in, you're there and it's lovely and there's no aches or pains or anything and you can lose yourself in your work. 26 years since his death, today's anniversary means the world to his widow. He always said, great writers, artists, creative people aren't really recognised until they die and I think that has happened to Rawl. I think his legacy is now enormous. Dahl's appeal spans generations and crosses borders. He's big box office too on stage and screen. It seems he was onto something when Dahl wrote, a little nonsense now and then is relished by the wisest men. Sally Bidolf, ITV News. I'm joined now by Donald Sturrock, Roald Dahl's official biographer and friend. Thanks for coming in. What do you think makes his storytelling so magical, so enduring? Well, I don't know. It's hard to say. There are so many ingredients. Perhaps the most interesting one to me is that he, he described himself once to me as a geriatric child. I think he had a confidence about the way he saw the world mm. through a child's eyes. He, he could remember very quickly what it was like to be six or seven or eight. And so many of us lose that when we grow exactly. up. Exactly. If we forget, you're always looking up at things. There are always things out of reach. You're always being told why you can't do something. And you sort of know that you could do it, you know. And, and I think he, he, he remembered that, and that was the, the impulse behind so many of his stories. What about the much-discussed darker themes in some of his books? Was that down to his childhood? He lost his father at a young age. What did you learn in writing um, that book? I don't know. I think, he th I think in a funny Anyway, he, I always got the impression from him that the loss of his father wasn't a particularly dark thing. He had a tremendous mother who, who was a very, very strong and influential figure in the family and raised him and his sisters, I mean, terrifically well. And he always saluted her and always said that really he didn't really remember his father, so losing the father wasn't, wasn't that much. I think it was, again, down to this feeling of confidence about the fact that there are dark things in life. You mm. know, bad things do happen. And 
and he was confident about writing about those dark things. Usually, I mean, I remember him once saying, so long as you do it with a whopping great laugh at the same time, so that you couldn't have in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory children being kind of put into a mincing machine actually and coming out as minced up people. But if you say, well, they came out as fudge, you know, that's funny and every child knows that's a joke, you know, and it's a, he was, he was very sure-footed, I think. We heard his widow say there that his legacy is now enormous, but perhaps wasn't when he was alive. Do you think <laughs> he would expect this massive celebration Roald Dahl Day? I think he'd be years shocked on his by birth? it, to be honest, because, I mean, when I, when I remember him, I knew him in the last five years that he was alive. You know, he was still quite unrecognised and uncelebrated. Um, and children's literature, too, was sort of in a ghetto. You know, it was, it, was, it was what you did if you couldn't write proper serious adult literature. And I think he blazed a trail for people like J.K. Yeah, Rowling. Yeah, sure. What's, what's your favourite book before you go? Oh, I don't know. Um, probably Fantastic Mr Fox. <laughs> Brilliant. OK, well, they're all just so, so good, aren't they? Uh, Donald Stark, thank you very much for coming in. Thank Pleasure. you. And we want to know what your favourite Roald Dahl book is. Vote on our website, itv.com slash news. And finally, millions of us have been basking in a burst of sunshine with today already confirmed as the hottest September day for almost 70 years. The south of England is enjoying the warmest of the weather, with London enjoying the best of it. This was sunrise over the Thames this morning. This lunchtime, many of the capital's parks and open spaces have been filled by people taking advantage of the hot air that's moved across from Spain just like they did back on September the 2nd, 1961, the last time temperatures soared so high at this time of year. Back then, the weather reached 31.6 degrees. Today, they are already higher. In the past hour, the Met Office has confirmed a reading of 32.8 degrees on the outskirts of London. That is the hottest since 1949. Well, if it's hot where you are, enjoy it while it lasts. A full weather forecast is coming up next, as are Mary Nightingale and Mark Austin with the ITV Evening News at 6.30. From me and everybody on the lunchtime team, bye-bye. <laughs>